Um, AMR is definitely still a major risk. It's not uh, in the same category as a, something that will kind of happen acutely overnight or over a month, but is a much slower burn risk. Uh, but where um, clearly not just uh, new infections, but the way that healthcare uh, has worked uh, for the last uh, few decades uh, means that uh, if antibiotics uh, cease working, then even very uh, routine healthcare is at risk. Uh, so that is uh, definitely the case. Uh, and of course, on uh, the malicious side, you know, whether um, you know, the kit committee will have looked uh, and considered many times on the uh, risks from state or non-state actors uh, on those, uh, uh, what type of attacks uh, either uh, on purpose or even uh, uh, releases uh, unintentionally. Uh, but I'll leave the malicious to one side, but I think pandemic flu, uh, infectious disease from animal origin and AMR. Thank you. Professor. Professor Simpson, you're still mute. So, uh, sorry, Chair. Um, I, I would agree with both uh, the previous speakers. Um, on natural occurring threats, um, pandemic influenza still it would be the number one threat, as it has happened three times um, in, in previous in previous century. Um, uh, AMR, antimicrobial resistance, is extremely important, um, and particularly um, transfer of diseases from animals across to humans and, and animal disease is, is, is a particular threat um, at, at, the, at the moment. Thank you. Could I just probe uh, slightly more, but not at, at length, Sir Patrick, um, on one issue. I noticed all of you drew together um, an infectious disease pandemic. Uh, um, but in, in um, 2017, I think it was, um, the risks of pandemic influenza and of emerging infectious diseases were considered separately and the infectious disease threat was thought to be perhaps less strong. Does that reflect a slight change in, in approach or understanding of recent years? Uh, well, the reason I would have it and the way I express it is I think pandemic flu remains the highest risk because yes. flu virus mutates so readily and can make the species jump. Therefore, we, we just know from history that's a big yeah. risk. Yeah. What we've now seen, of course, is coronavirus can make that leap in quite a dramatic way as well. So you'd have to say that actually a coronavirus um, outbreak with a mutation is possible, although this virus mutates much less easily and um, much less quickly than, than flu. Um, and I think uh, other um, jumps from animals to humans and other, other infectious diseases could come. So as a group, you might say, well, there's a possibility there that could be as high as pandemic flu, but for each individual one, it's got to be, much, I suspect it's much less. And one of the problems is it's very difficult to predict. And, and actually, if you look at the history of the last uh, you know, 20 years or more, people have been, it's not been easy at all to predict what is the next infectious oh, disease. No, absolutely. Um, that brings me on or back to the, to the question of the National Security Risk Assessment. That process at the present time is led by the Civil Contingencies Secretariat. And I would like, again, like to ask each of you in turn, how you'd characterize your organization's involvement in that risk assessment process. So you again first, if you don't mind, Sir Patrick. Um, so as you say, this is led by the Civil Contingencies Secretariat. Um, the role of the Government Chief Scientific Advisor and the Government Office for Science is to comment on help and probe methodology. So to look at the way in which it's done and to see whether there are ways in which there could be new science that could help that. The Chief Scientific Advisors across departments will look at the um, risks that are coming up through departments and try to be part of commenting, challenging and, and, uh, and making sure that those have got the right external input. And then the aggregate across the group of chief scientific advisors and this office here, Government Office for Science, will look across and see whether we think we've got consistency and whether there are some things that we, we think may be missing or, or, or misplaced. 
Um, but our, our role is one of advice and challenge uh, with the process being owned by the Civil Contingency Secretariat and by individual departments. Thank you. Ms. Swinson? Thank you. Um, so yes, the Cabinet Office lead that the cross-government process. Uh, the departments, uh, so my department, DHSC, leads on uh, our respective and relevant risks which as you know, is pandemic flu, the emerging, emerging infectious disease and AMR, uh, and also input on the cyber security risk uh, and the provider failure, particularly on the adult social, on the adult social care. Um, so it's our responsibility to update the risk assessments, uh, both on the uh, likelihood and impact, uh, which we commissioned from PHE, which I'm so sure Professor Simpson will go on to talk about, uh, and then to um, submit those to the Cabinet Office uh, and take any further questions or challenge uh, from them. Uh, and they clearly look at the relative positioning of the risks that come uh, across government. Um, and then, of course, um, once that process uh, is complete in any given cycle, uh, we're responsible for the um, uh, planning and responsiveness uh, against those risks uh, and the readiness of government. Thank you. Professor Simpson? Yes, uh, our, our role is to protect and improve the nation's health. Amongst other things in this area, in this field, we track and monitor potential threats um, around the world. We develop new technologies to detect potential threats, uh, both naturally occurring and due to deliberate release. And we conduct exercises and to test and improve the to, to detect and improve the protocols. Um, as, as, as has previously been said, we do develop risk assessments, and that process does include our veterinary colleagues to uh, and, and to have a one health approach to, to the threats. We support the cross-government biosecurity work. Um, we input into the implementation of the strategy and we have uh, various mechanisms where we assist in delivery of response. Okay, um, and just one more to you, Sir Patrick, and then I'll move on. Um, we've, we hear a lot in this, all this process of risk assessment and planning and so on. We keep hearing the phrase reasonable worst case scenario. What does that mean to you? And do you do you find it? Do you think it's been helpful in dealing with the present pandemic? The reasonable worst case scenario is a, is a process owned centrally by the uh, Civil Contingency Secretariat, and we input um, uh, in, in this case from Sage in terms of providing some of the modelling to, to to go behind that. And it is an assessment of something that could happen. Is not likely to happen but would be um the sort of worst case you think would be a reasonable thing to appear and and you know therefore there's an element of subjectiveness in it because in, inevitably it relies on certain assumptions it relies on certain boundaries of what you think is reasonable and what you think is not reasonable it's not the absolutely worst thing that could ever happen and it's not the most likely thing that you think will happen and it's somewhere between those two bounded by an assessment of what seems reasonable and that's where the subjectiveness comes in so it has a utility for planning purposes but i think of course it has very wide uncertainty around that and one has to take that into account when thinking about planning thank you um baroness lane fox thank you i'm going to ask some questions about planning as well Firstly, please to Ms. Swinson. Hi there. Um, you have specific responsibility, as you've already said, for um, the public health uh, risks and the supporting the response to the public health risks. In the 2018 Biological Security Strategy, strategy Security Strategy, Strategy, not Security, yes, Security Strategy, um, you were uh, already doing some work, I think, with the existing way you were organized. So, two questions really. Firstly, what is the work you do beyond strategic? What's the response that you undertake? And has it changed after the 2018 strategic review? Thank you. Um, so I think you're asking about the biological uh, security strategy, are you? Yes, so um, within that uh, uh, 
strategy that brought together the different biological risks uh, facing government. Uh, I think two things uh, that I would say, one is that the DHSC and other relevant departments kind of retain, of course, responsibility for uh, those elements that are our lead, so pandemic flu uh, and global health security. Um, at that point, there was also governance uh, put in place for the things uh, across, right, right across government, which is a home office lead. We're part of that uh, overall governance board uh, and a working group uh, that's met, uh, I think, 12 times since the um, report was published. Um, so um, we take expert input um, in all of the uh, areas we've just talked about. Um, and then in terms of the role of the Department of Health, you know, we are the um, leaders of the health and care system. We do some things responsible for some things directly. So, for example, preparing uh, the legislation uh, that um, uh, was part of the PAM flu uh, work uh, and which was helpful in uh, uh, preparing for the Coronavirus Act. Uh, we do other things which are um, coming together with our arms length bodies, whether that's PHE or NHS England, for example, on working on surge plans. Uh, we're not a, you know, the operations for that uh, is in NHS England uh, and uh, also, um, for example, in local resilience fora, uh, but we uh, work, um, so we're not operational as a department ourselves, if that was your uh, question, but we work with uh, colleagues in NHS England, local government, uh, Public Health England and others uh, on, the, on the things that um, uh, the plans uh, should be putting in place. So did much change after the 2018 strategy? Um, so I would take that together with each review of the National Security Risk Assessment. Um, it's on the basis of those reasonable worst case scenarios um, that, uh, and there wasn't a major change in 2018. Um, I think um, as uh, Sir Patrick was saying, uh, in terms of the reasonable worst case scenario, uh, you know, both on the infection rate uh, and on um, uh, mortality rate, uh, and now what we've seen for this actual pandemic, uh, taking what we have seen from pandemic flu and the SARS and MERS outbreaks together, uh, clearly um, since, the, since our planning and the uh, SAGE and Cabinet Office work on reasonable worst case scenario for this pandemic, uh, that shows a much uh, greater reasonable worst case scenario for the, emerging, for the coronavirus uh, than in uh, uh, the 2018 uh, mass risk uh, assessment. Thank you. And now to Professor Simpson, could you talk a bit about um, PHE's role in the, in the same way, sort of moving from strategy to planning and how you respond? Um, P PHE works with uh, NHS England and with the, the, with the Department of Health and so Social Care to, to, uh, work, to work with them to do the plans for particularly high consequence infectious disease um, an example would be that after the Ebola in West Africa um, outbreak, we'd, we've done, we did a two year project with NHS England looking at how best we could improve the treatment facilities for people with high consequence infectious diseases. And that's been used in various, uh, various outbreaks, such as um, the monkeypox outbreak and for the, for the building of respiratory um, treatment facilities for the early cases of, of COVID-19. Of COVID we, we work with our colleagues uh, working on the plans for these, for biological threats, both malicious and, um, and naturally occurring. Um, and also we uh, design and deliver exercises for the Department of Health and Social Care to test the systems and, and to learn lessons uh, based on the exercises. Thank you. Finally, thank you, Sir Patrick. Could you answer the same point about how the Government Office for Science also moves from strategy to planning for the biological threats? And then also I'm interested in the natural hazard forward look, even though I consider myself fairly good at Google, I found it very hard to find any information about this and the process. Perhaps you could talk a little bit about that group and what it does. Yes. So. Um... The Government Office for Science in, provides advice in it, so we're not part of the planning process for this at all. And um, our input is part of what leads to um, any, any sort of um, strategy considerations. We don't, we don't get involved in the operational side of this 
um, and it's a relatively small office. So it's it, it, the operational side, it's different departments and in agencies such as um, Public Health England. The natural hazard, um, international nat uh, natural hazard forward um, um, uh, look is, is a um, way of bringing together the assessments that take place in a number of agencies. So the Animal and Plant Health Agency, um, Public Health England, British Geological Survey, and others and bring them together in a um, format to be able to look globally at what the trends and um, risks are and that then gets circulated to um, various parts of Whitehall in order to be able to get a map of the world and see what, what sort of changes are taking place and that's brought together um, by the government office. So just one final question, does that work? Well, it, it, wor uh, it works in the sense that I think it is an aggregate of all of the detailed scans undertaken by the component agencies. And it's been pretty good at spotting where things are happening. Um, but, you know, is it, is it the, the perfect mechanism to bring it all together? I don't know. Um, it, it, it relies very heavily on the detailed work that takes place in each of those agencies, which have all of the sort of... Um, scientific muscle and, and, and clout behind them to actually do the scans. And so that's the key key input to that. The um, aggregation of that into a sort of single map is, is in a sense of a, um, a rather easier part of the process. Thank you. Lord Harris. Yes, could I follow that up? And I think the first question is really to Clara Swinson. Um, the bio, um, we've been, thinking about the biological security strategy. And this envisages a cross-departmental governance board, which would oversee the shared commitments under that strategy. How exactly does that board work? And what is the department's role in this? And could you tell us, I don't know, how frequently the uh, board has met and what have been the main outcomes of its work so far? Yes. Um, of course, good afternoon. Um, so um, the Governance Board brings together Home Office, DEFRA and DHSC as the three departments uh, uh, for HMG who published uh, that strategy, uh, together with PHE, MOD, uh, Bayes, a range of other government departments. Um, and it, uh, I think, has uh, met twice at that high level, senior civil servant level, uh, since the publication of the strategy. There is a working group as well uh, that's uh, met much more frequently uh, and uh, that um, work reports into uh, the security minister, it's a home office lead, and uh, from there on uh, into the cabinet office uh, as required. Uh, that's uh, looking at the biological um, strategy overall. As that document sets out, uh, that much of the work is within the department's uh, existing governance strategies uh, governance uh, mechanisms uh, and so that's the case uh, for example on the pandemic uh, flu preparedness board uh, and uh, the work that we've just been talking to uh, on the national risk assessment work with cabinet office and other government departments. Okay I mean you describe a fairly top heavy governance board. Um, my experience of those is that they don't always work very well, that uh, uh, attendance is poor. You've said it's met twice. Was it reasonably well attended? So, so um, in terms of the, the range of departments that uh, are required at that board and are on the membership, uh, you'd have to... Uh, We'd have to check in with the Home Office, but I believe so. Uh, the working group, in terms of the uh, work that, that reports and then a progress update uh, that that can uh, uh, that I believe that is bringing together. Uh, of course, with the onset uh, of the pandemic, uh, all of those departments are now working very hard on uh, the response to the pandemic, uh, and I would have thought that. Um, uh, we would need to uh, look at both progress against that strategy, uh, its government, governance, uh, and uh, the progress against it uh, when we are out of the acute phase of the pandemic. Okay, thank you. Could I ask Sir Patrick, um, the biological security strategy specifically envisages that the government chief scientific advisor will maintain oversight of the strategy's outcomes. 
Now, somebody told me, and I have no idea whether this is accurate, that this was not something that you were consulted about before it uh, appeared in the strategy. But could you tell us how you fulfilled that role? Uh, yeah, well, the, the, clearly the, the strategy was written before I uh, joined and published after I joined. And so I certainly was not consulted about it, not expected to be. Um, uh, and I think that strategy was put together from um, um, the Home Office, I believe, as, as the way to produce that. And, and the role that um, we then clarified that was expected of the Government Chief Scientific Advisor um, is to look at the annual update report against, progr uh, against progress and for us to comment on it. And, and that is, is what I'm expecting uh, to happen as part of that. Right, so it's a fairly hands-off role, your um, uh, oversight. As, as currently constructed, that is the role that's, that's been described, which is that the um, annual review takes place, there's a report that's provided, and that then comes to me for comment and review. Okay. And I mean, this is more general to all the witnesses, though I suppose primarily to Clara Swinson and uh, Professor Simpson. With the experience of COVID, how could the biological security strategy be changed to improve the cross-government approach, and in particular the central to local government approach to biosecurity risks? Thanks, uh, happy to take that first. Uh, so I think um, it's very much as you've uh, just uh, talked about the central governments uh, coming together. I think on the central to um, local, those reasonable worst case scenarios that we turn, talked about are provided to local resilience for uh, and it's the responsibility of each uh, government department working with uh, the Ministry for Housing and Communities Local Government uh, to uh, make sure that uh, they have the, uh, uh, are provided with the reasonable worst case scenarios in order to plan against. Um, I think with the experience of um, uh, coronavirus, uh, then clearly looking at the uh, the scope and extent of the biological uh, threats that uh, uh, the UK faces um, would be something uh, you know that as well as the priorities for each department whether that uh, needs to go broader the horizon scanning function uh, and then the types of things that need to be done as you've already pointed to between national regional local levels uh, according uh, to those risks uh, all i would say is that any um strategy or um risk assessment you know and with a worst case scenario none of those things are a prediction uh, and so responding to something obviously you take the plans that you've got they'll always need amending uh, and once we learn from this um which i'm sure we might uh, come back to you know it's a uh, it's a problem for all kinds of crises that you end up uh, preparing for the next one as if it was going to be the same as the current one. Uh, and uh, we'll know, um, of course, and can prepare as far as possible for future threats, but we'll, we'll know that the next one won't be exactly like this one. So you need an element of flexibility uh, in that. Uh, yeah, I understand that. I mean, could I just come back? I mean, we're coming, we're going to move on to local resilience forms in more detail, but I can envisage a circumstance where, uh, this area of work generates a, um, um, you know, a, a, a best worst case, you know, a worst case, um, uh, reasonable worst case uh, scenario, and so do all the other high risks. And these all arrive simultaneously or over the course of uh, uh, the working year at a local resilience forum. Does anybody say, actually, this is the one or these are the ones you ought to be taking more seriously? Was any particular priority given to these? Yes, you make a very good point. I think that's the role of the Cabinet Office, looking at all of the risks from departments, uh, putting them in the risk assessment, uh, thinking of which of those are then uh, tiered into tier one, two and three, uh, and uh, they're responsible uh, for then uh, uh, putting those out to local resilience borough with any guidance uh, about uh, which ones to focus on. Uh, as I'm sure we'll uh, come on to, obviously in any given time frame and exercising, uh, programs, for example, on um, exercise sickness, flu, the Cabinet Office have decided, you know, uh, according to priority to work on other major risks, such as national blackout or flooding, uh, depending, uh, and then therefore they get a particular focus in any in that given year. 
I don't know whether Professor Simpson or, or, or Sir Patrick, for that matter, Professor Simpson wants to comment. Um, yes, yes, thank you. Um, from a, from Public Health England's standpoint, we do have uh, obviously we have health, local health protection teams who who deal with with um, we, who deal with actually the actual hands-on control of infectious disease. An important part of our, our, our work nationally is to is to get um, what the what the cabinet office is and the CCS's priorities are to those local teams and to produce plans and to exercise on on those priorities which may be biological but but um, may well be um, non-biological threats such as cyber threats or or threats mm -hmm. to uh, or threats such as um, uh, power outages. So we, that, that's that's the way we work. And I think from COVID nineteen, this is this is a part of our activity that we will need to be strengthened. Okay, I don't know if Sir Patrick wants to add anything. Well, maybe the, the only thing to say is is that when we think about the um, assessment of. Um, likelihood and impact. It's that methodology of how to get that right, which becomes very important in terms of then the prioritization of these things. And that is particularly difficult when you are trying to compare chronic risk with episodic risk. And I think that is an area that we're looking quite carefully to say, well, how could you get that um, to be in a way that will then be meaningful as you translate that into priorities? Lord King, Thank I you. think you, you can, Lord King, you considered coming, coming in on this. Yeah. Yes, I want to. in particular for Sir Patrick, in your oversight of the outcomes of this strategy, you're doing that, who do you report to? Uh, well, um, uh, the job that, in terms of commenting on this, then goes into the Civil Contingencies Secretariat and the document that's signed off finally by the uh, National, uh, National Security Committee. But who do you actually report to? Oh, I report to the um, to the cabinet secretary. To the cabinet secretary. Yes. Uh, and then, how many different cabinet secretaries actually haven't been haven't had the same turnover? Who is he reporting to? Does he report to the prime minister? The prime minister. Yeah, because it's one of the problems about who's actually taking responsibility at senior level and ministerial level, and the amount of changes that have been seemed to me to have people. Who actually have some understanding of the uh, area of responsibilities they have is a major problem at the present time. Do you agree? Oh, well, I, th I think in any organisation, uh, turnover can be an issue in terms of institutional memory and other expertise. Yeah, but you found that the Cabinet Office understood the strategy, knew where it had come from, and knew what its objectives oh. were. I think the Civil Contingency Secretariat has had very strong, consistent leadership, and uh, I mean, it's, yeah. it's respond to. Um, but they, the, the, sorry, who's the leadership of the Civil Contingency Secretariat? Well, so so Catherine Hammond was leading it until very recently. She has moved on now, but for the entire time I've been in post, she was the person who was leading this. Right. Thanks. Thank you, Baroness Hodgson. Thank you very much. So um, my questions revolve around scientific expertise during emergencies and the SAGE system. Um, and particularly to Sir Patrick, the SAGE mechanism is vital for ensuring that scientific expertise underpins decision-making during emergencies. But how do the SAGE activations work? And in your view, what are the strengths and weaknesses of this model for getting scientific input when monitoring and dealing with significant public health risks? And in particular, what happens when there are diverse viewpoints, as we read in the papers, have happened uh, from time to, uh, over this pandemic? And how do you reconcile the views of different scientists to come forward with, with, with recommendations, solid clear recommendations for policy makers decisions on. Okay, lots of questions there and I will uh, do my best to answer them all. Um, so the process of activating SAGE is that it is called by COBRA. So when COBRA is called, 
they can call SAGE for an issue which is complex, cross-government and requires scientific advice. Separately, uh, there's something called a precautionary SAGE, which I can trigger if I wish to, to try and get ahead of things and to uh, try to anticipate that SAGE would be called. But formally, it's a COBRA decision to call SAGE. The Government Office for Science then um, assembles the experts that we need for any particular emergency. And in my time, in uh, the two and a half years I've been here, that's included um, uh, Novichok, it's included Todbrook uh, Reservoir, it's included um, uh, a, a precautionary sage on Ebola, um, uh, and of course, um, a, a lot on COVID. Um, the office will go out to um, government departments where there are experts on scientific advisory committees, so usually external people from government who are known to be on scientific advisory committees. We will ask the learned academies for experts. We have our own expert lists and we will ask specialist bodies and we'll bring together a range of experts for the problem we have in front of us. That doesn't mean that those individuals would be on SAGE for the entire duration of whatever the um, problem is that we're trying to address. You asked uh, a specific uh, question about public health and in matters of public health, SAGE is co-chaired between the government chief scientific advisor and the chief medical officer as it has been during uh, this outbreak for very obvious reasons. Um, and the CMO has ultimate accountability for, um, for public health matters. That then brings in a whole uh, other raft of experts who can um, be part of this. Um, inevitably, and this is exactly what you'd expect for and hope when you brought together a group of diverse scientists, it would be very surprising if everybody thought exactly the same thing. Um, we have subgroups which feed into SAGE, and on this particular um, emergency, we've got many subgroups that feed into SAGE. So we've got um, uh, at least 100 people who are working on this, uh, usually nearly all outside academics, but also, of course, the chief scientific advisors from departments who are outside academics who come into government for a short period. Um, and those bodies will, will feed in information as well, and they will have their own um, consensus uh, um, process to try and come up with um, um, uh, consensus input into SAGE. SAGE is a process of then trying to come up with um, a view with the uncertainties expressed. And it's very clear that science is very seldom a complete utter fact that is um, immutable and something that's never going to change. Normally, science is the best representation of what you can know today, but accept that as more evidence accumulates, you will, of course, need to change. And it's a position of trying to the uncertainties around the um, evidence that you have today. So that's that's the way that um, say it works. And I will say one, maybe one final thing to then ask you whether I've answered your question. Um, we've also worked a lot with international bodies and other um, science advisors in other countries, uh, many of whom have, have been across the look at the stage mechanism because it is unusual. It doesn't take place in all other countries. Some have got the model a bit like it, not many. And um, over the past um, 18 months or so, uh, we've done mock exercises with Canada and the US where they've been to look at the SAGE model and we've done mock exercises where we've had a similar problem that they've tackled through their process, we've tackled through our process and uh, we try to learn from each other. Thank you. I think you've you've covered most of that. Um, could I just add, ask one other thing that how would SAGE cope if there were multiple emergencies at once? Yes, well, um, maybe I, I, I may answer that in two ways. But actually, the first thing to say is how does SAGE cope with an emergency that's gone on for 62 meetings, which is where we are at the moment. Mm. That, that itself brings a challenge because um, it's not, it, it, it wasn't designed to work for that length of period. And it does put strain on the academics and others who contribute to this. And we taken a lot of trouble to try and make sure that they are as protected as possible in their own institutions to be able to contribute and I would like to on the record here say how brilliantly they have performed and how much they've given up 
almost all of their other life, both professional and often personal, in order to work on the problems that we've been tackling during this COVID crisis. But resilience of long-term um, application to SAGE is a big issue that I think um, we need to formalise going forward, and indeed for the team looking after them in the Government Office for Science. One of the things that we've done over the summer is exactly what you're uh, um, getting at, which is concurrent emergencies. And <laughs> we've now got a separate team set up in um, the Government Office for Science looking at concurrent emergencies. I've been receiving briefings on some of the um, updates on other areas that we would be concerned about in, in emergencies. And we are um, set up to run a parallel process should that be required. It won't be easy though. Thank you very much. I think my colleague Baroness Neville-Jones wanted to come in here. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, so Patrick, you rather presciently got onto the uh, subject that I wanted to ask you about. Um, you said in answer to Baroness Hodgson right at the beginning, you said COBRA calls SAGE into uh, action when cross-government uh, advice uh, the cross government activity is required and, and it requires scientific advice. Um, I mean, COBRA is a, is a, is a, is a short-term emergency body, not really designed to mastermind you know, a long-term um, activity of the kind that, that uh, COVID has clearly become. Now, you've talked about the effect on SAGE itself what is your view about the actual uh, machinery of government, though, in relation to uh, the, sa the advice that SAGE is giving? What one doesn't hear is you no know, mention of the National Security Council itself. So what's been your experience um, you know, as, you, as you've gone on? To, to whom and in which bodies do you find yourself reporting? I mean, are you asked, for example, to attend the National Security Council? Or what relationship do you have with decision-making bodies? Yeah. Um, in, in answer to the question about the National Security Council, yes, I attend the National Security Council on this and other matters, and uh, there have been obviously several sessions which have discussed COVID, but the government has established a, um, the cabinet office has established a structure for dealing with COVID um, with a central team based in cabinet office and ministerial committees that take accountability. Uh, plus, of course, there are lead departments, the most um, central of which is obviously DHSC. So the output from um, SAGE goes to all departments. It goes to the Cabinet Office um, COVID Task Force and will feed into the ministerial committees. Um, it will also go, uh, obviously, to DHSC. Um, it's worth saying, of course, there are other forms of scientific advice that feed in through departments, and each of the chief mm. scientific advisors in the departments will listen to SAGE and take their own information back to departments, and many of them will have their own advisory boards feeding into specific questions in departments, much more operational than SAGE would be, and DHSC has its own forms of scientific advice to feed in as well. But that's the route, R rather than what would happen in, in a shorter term emergency, whereas our output would be SAGE to Civil Contingencies Secretariat and COBRA, it's a slightly more complicated picture now, but our key recipients would be the Cabinet Office COVID uh, Task Force. Well, that's very interesting. Thank you. Um, it seems to me, um, I don't know what, you, what view you take, that you know, some of these emergencies that we're going to face in the future are going to be of longer duration and requiring you know, extensive follow-up to the initial um, event. Um, do you think what you've just described is something of a model that will be replicated, possibly of, of uh, involving different departments, but uh, of a kind which we will now need to go for when we're dealing with you know, longer term situations where the society has to live with the whatever, whatever is afflicting it for a period of time? Well, I think the, the model of requiring um, central coordination and a team to run it, um, where it runs across department is obviously one that makes sense from an operational perspective. Um, and I think that um, as things become more chronic uh, problems, it's rather mm. important that departments pick up the running of that. Um, and so 
you know, DHSC has done a lot, and that's part of why organisations like the Joint Biosecurity Centre have come into play, because there needs to be a more long-term, stable system with internal government um, science providing advice into it, plus getting its own external input, rather than um, thinking that you can run this from SAGE for the whole time, because SAGE is an advisory body built up from external academics largely, it's not part of the government operational machinery and can't, it certainly can't be something that, that uh, runs for very long periods. So government, the government departments have to take it as part of their normal operations in um, effect, yes. So in, in the end, your role at some point will come to an end. I mean, other than from time to time offering advice. Yes, I mean, I think that's, uh, if you can, if you take a short term emergency, that's exactly what happens. Cobra calls SAGE, SAGE meets for the duration of the emergency, COBRA stands down, SAGE stands down, and in, in a way something similar at some point will happen here. Thank you very much. Lord Paul, and I apologise, I gather I didn't see your hand before, I'm sorry about that. That's all right. Well, Sir Patrick, just continuing on the, on the questions of SAGE, some of our earlier witnesses have suggested that it's not a diverse enough body. Now, I'm, being, I'm quite simple-minded. I would expect a scientific advisory committee to be full of scientists, but apparently they think there should be other sorts of um, skills represented there, more operational skills, people who know about supply chains and that sort of thing. Do you think there's any validity in that criticism or are you happy to see non-scientific issues left entirely to non-scientific bodies? Well, I'm quite a believer in getting um, uh, experts to run what they know about. And SAGE is science advice um, uh, for government emergencies. It's not the advice how to operationalize things. It's not the advice on economics. It's not the advice on all sorts of policy matters. And I think it's rather important that it isn't. Our role is to provide, to the best of our ability, scientific input into decision making and advice that needs to be integrated by ministers and others, taking into account many other forms of evidence and advice. And I, I really think it would be a mistake to try and um, integrate all of that into a single body, not least because the output then becomes something which sounds like a ministerial decision, which is something that SAGE simply, can't, in my opinion, can't and shouldn't do. I think that's absolutely right. On the other hand, there is an impression that um, SAGE has been asked questions which are not strictly within its, within its ambit um, for advice on, on, on wider issues. Do you think it has been misused at all in that sense? But perhaps slightly more impertinently, do you think politicians have taken, taken to hiding behind SAGE in order to thrust SAGE forward as to be the apparent responsible for the decisions they don't themselves want to take or be associated with? Well, if we get questions which may come from departments or come from um, centrally that we think are not science questions, we tell people they're not science questions and we stick to um, giving the scientific advice. Um, the scientific advice, of course, can be interpreted as a policy position, which it's not. I mean, it can be turned into a policy position, but that's for somebody else to do. Um, and we we stick with we stick with giving advice. Um, and one of the things which I think has been important in this um, uh, pandemic has been uh, the, the sage advice has been very visible, has been um, open. Uh, we publish all of our papers and our minutes, and it's there for everyone to see. And therefore, it attracts a lot of attention as being somehow the advice, mm -hmm. it's not the advice it's simply the science advice. And the science advice needs to be incorporated in, in, with all the other advice that ministers rightly will need in order to make decisions. And some of that is obviously less visible than SAGE. So I think part of the reason that SAGE has been quite so prominent um, in terms of the way people think about this is the visibility of the advice that we give in comparison with perhaps where other advice comes from. So you don't think in any way SAGE has been misused by ministers, not in a malicious sense, but simply as an excuse sometimes? Well, you're straying, uh, Lord Paul, way outside my area of expertise on, on how politicians might behave in this circumstance. I mean, uh, I'm a great believer in straying uh, outside those limits. <laughs> Lord right, Harris, um, I think you wanted to come in at this point. <laughs> 
sorry, I, I'm, I suspect Sir Patrick will think I'm straying too far as well, but it's sometimes been said to me that uh, yourself and the chief medical officer have appeared like a human shield around ministers. Is that something you recognise or have ever felt? Well, I'm sorry, and I didn't mean to accuse Lord Paul of straying. I, I, I mean, I was in danger of straying beyond my expertise. Um, uh, I think that um, if I answer the question in a slightly different way, it, it, have I felt uncomfortable at times during this? Of course I have. Um, it's been, you know, it's been a position of visibility which I uh, wouldn't seek, and it's a position of visibility which I do not enjoy um, in, 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 from that uh, side. But I don't think that... Um, you know, we've done anything other than try to present the science as we see it in the fairest way with the uncertainty clear. How others choose to interpret that and use that is a different matter. And I, I don't think, I don't feel that we've been used as, as in, in any way as, as shields. I don't think that's the tenor of the discussions that I've had inside government. Thank you very much. Mr. McNeil, you want to come in on this point? Yeah, indeed. Uh, thank you very much. It basically is on the sort of the groupthink uh, idea that's in uh, that could be in Sage, and how much sort of learning we, are you doing from uh, colleagues across Europe? Um, it's an obviously a difficult question, but there's one in particular that that stands out and have banished um, COVID three times in the Faroe Islands, and I'm just wondering how much you might have learned from places like that uh, in regards level of testing uh, and searching for asymptomatics as well, and maybe. Um, given they've banished COVID from the territory three times, is there anything that you can transfer over? Yes. Um, well, we speak, uh, but when I say we, that's both me and, and the chief medical officers speak a lot to our colleagues around the world, not just in Europe, but around the world. I have regular calls with um, uh, Canada, New Zealand, uh, Singapore, South Korea, Japan, and many European countries. And um, we're all learning from each other. Um, I haven't spoken to the Faroe Islands, I'm, so that's one that I haven't, but um, uh, we have spoken to a lot of different places. Uh, it's perhaps not surprising, but it's always somewhat amazing when you hear that we're all struggling with exactly the same issues, of course. Um, and I think we're all keen to uh, make sure that we don't um, go down one particular path blindly. Um, Chris Whitty is also very linked into the WHO, so gets a lot of input from, from there as well. Um, and the groupthink issue is, is a really important one. On SAGE, um, we do have a range of different members. We do refresh the participation from time to time. And we did appoint somebody a few months ago now um, to observe us, somebody who was experienced to make sure that we don't get into groupthink, or if we do, he can point it out to us. So we do our best to do it. Um, and with over a hundred um, people in different subgroups and each of those having groups behind them in institutions around the UK, um, we certainly pull from a very wide range of science. And we were very keen and very pleased when the Royal Society set up bodies to do um, uh, some of the same things. So we get a sort of view, like an independent view on this. So I think, I think that- I mean Group thing, but I mean, you know, you, you, it's one of those things you don't know until. Of course. Anyway. I mean, it would, it, would, it would just seem to, you know, they found that 80% of those are positive are, are asymptomatic and they keep searching out the asymptomatics. I mean, the problem we have, certainly in Scotland and in the wider UK, is not wanting to test anybody unless they're showing symptoms, which leaves 80% of those carriers un, unbothered uh, by the entire process. Uh, but also their levels of testing and population are over 200%. I mean, they've having banished um, COVID three times from the territory, I would suggest that probably it's a search for the asymptomatics and those levels of testing that have probably done it for them. And it's our problem that we just don't have the capacity to, to test at that level. And therefore, uh, we, are, we are stuck with the situation of just only really searching out the people who are, say they've got symptoms. Well, uh, okay. F first thing is just a, a, um, a sort of tangential point, but important, which is the notion of eliminating COVID from anywhere, as you've just described, is is not right because it'll come back. And so, you yeah, it's, it's it's come from other territories that haven't tested as well. Elimination <laughs> strategies and so on. You know, the, 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 I think that's very unlikely. Um, the although, although you could, if every territory was doing the same thing, 
Yeah, you, uh, you would imagine that then yeah. everybody could banish it. But if one territory is doing it and the other 199 aren't doing it, basically, it was in the world, yeah. even a difficulty. And, and, and I mean, it's worth reflecting that there's only one human uh, disease that's been truly eradicated, and that's with a highly oh. effective vaccine, smallpox. So it's, it's a very difficult thing to do. Um, in terms of testing, you're absolutely right. There's a high proportion of asymptomatics. Um, it is a little unclear still exactly what that proportion is. Um, it may be uh, um, something uh, around 60% or so overall, but I think there's quite wide uncertainty around estimates of exactly how many people really, really are asymptomatic. Um, but uh, would I like to be able to test far more? Or do I think the UK ought, you know, would be in a better position if it could test far more? Yes, because we know that the only way you pick up a lot of people is through testing. And the testing then needs to be linked to action of isolation. So it's no good just to test. You need to do something at the end of it in terms of isolation. And um, the more you can get out there and, and, and test across asymptomatics as well, particularly in areas like care homes in hospital settings and so on and I think this is a strategy which the DHSC has laid out for testing uh, the better um, and at the moment and Clara could speak to this um, more than I can but at the moment the testing capacity is such that I think the UK is testing more than, than, than any other country in Europe but it's nowhere near enough to do what you've just described yet. On a, on a final small point <clears throat> the tests will work just as well on people who are symptomatic and asymptomatic because the, the test is looking for the virus and therefore it doesn't matter whether the uh, patient is showing the symptom or not or is, is that right or wrong? It's basically well, it's, it, it's, it's, it's almost right in the sense that um, you're right, absolutely right, the test is picking up the virus and therefore anyone who's shedding the virus will test positive. Um, the only area where it might be a bit more difficult is, is um, if you're asymptomatic, you may get a less good swab because you may have less material. Yeah. Um, so occasionally you, you'll find people who are asymptomatic who, who may, may have, a, there may be a slightly lower sensitivity, but the test will pick up um, both asymptomatic and symptomatic. Thank you. Mr. Jones. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just a quick supplemental for Sir Patrick, and then my questions are primarily about Public Health England. So I'll come to Professor Simpson after that. Sir Patrick, you just said that the only example of something that's been eradicated was smallpox with a highly effective vaccine. Just to push a little further on that, does that mean that in our deliberations in this inquiry, we need to envisage even with a vaccine that we don't yet know how successful it's going to be for COVID, that this is something we're going to need to manage year on, year out in the same way as influenza, for example? Uh, I think that's quite likely. Um, now, of course, we can't be certain, but um, I think it's unlikely that we will end up with a truly sterilizing vaccine, i.e. something that completely stops infection. And it's likely that this disease will circulate and um, be endemic, would be my best assessment. And I think that's the view of many people on mm. the stage, that that's a likely outcome. Um, clearly, uh, as management becomes better, as you get vaccination, which would decrease the um, chance of infection and the severity of disease or whatever the profile of the vaccines are, this then starts to look more like annual flu than anything else. Uh, and that may be the direction we end, up, we end up going in. Thank you for that. And so to Professor Simpson, uh, in, in, in that context, uh, I mean, we're all conscious that the Health Secretary was very critical of Public Health England and has since made the decision to instigate the National Institute for Health Protection as its successor body and one of those criticisms from the health secretary was that PHE didn't have a permanent standing capacity to respond to these issues or to scale up quick enough to respond to these issues. Given we've already heard today that uh, similar but non-COVID related threats are still the highest priority threat for us in the context that we're discussing today, could you just help us understand whether PHE had that mandate in the past to provide a standing capacity to respond and if it did whether it was given sufficient resources in your view to do so? I think, thank you very much. Um, the, the, there, is, there is quite a lot to be said for the principle of uh, bringing together Test and Trace of uh, the Joint Biosecurity Centre and PHE's health protection functions under one roof. Um, and we're already beginning to collaborate very closely on this. Um, it, it was in, from Public Health England's mandate it was to protect the health of the public um, and we, one, one part of that was to develop technologies 
such as testing um, to novel to novel pathogens. Um, <clears throat> it wasn't an explicit part of the, the mandate that that Public Health England could massively increase the ability to do that on a, on a very large scale. Um, and that is one of the things and one of the lessons learned from, from this, from the COVID-19 situation, which, which can be dealt with in, as part of the new organization and part of its remit. But, but perhaps my, my colleague, um, uh, uh, Clara Swinson may, may wish to come in from a DHSC perspective. Uh, Clara, please feel free to do so. I mean, if PHE's job was to um, kind of consider the risks and, uh, and build a, a model for responding, but then was not able to scale up in order to respond when it actually happened, was that the department's role to respond? Whose role was it? I'm happy to come in. Um, so, um, going back to where we start on the reasonable worst case scenario, in terms of um, what uh, each agency, uh, whether that's central government departments or not, um, was planning to do. I think the scale of what has happened on coronavirus, uh, given the asymptomatic uh, spread uh, and the differences from a influenza pandemic, uh, meant that, you know, when this started, you know, there wasn't a test. So first it was a new virus, um, had to develop a test, then had to scale up. Um, now, um, getting to that scale now, you know, 300,000 uh, a day, we've got the technical expertise uh, to create that, create those tests. We didn't have, uh, as some countries, for example, Germany, you know, had a very large uh, private diagnostic sector uh, that could be put to that. So we've had uh, to increase uh, the volume of testing uh, and ministers decided uh, to uh, set that up under NHS Test and Trace. Uh, that does use a lot of PHE capability uh, and as the Secretary of State set out uh, in August, you know, our aim for, the, uh, for this winter uh, is to focus on responding to the next wave of coronavirus uh, and ministers decided that uh, an agency that uh, had a single focus on health protection um, was uh, uh, designed to look at all biosecurity uh, and other threats uh, to health uh, was uh, a change that they wanted to make um, so that uh, the health improvement uh, uh, parts of uh, Public Health England uh, will, um, uh, that final decisions on the design of that will need to be taken but will, but will not be part of the same agency that's looking at those direct health threats. I'm happy so to pick up any of your questions that I haven't reminded. Thank you. So, so prior to the institution, the National Institute for Health Protection idea, it was the department's responsibility to be able to scale up to meet these responses, these, these problems, not PHEs. Have I understood that right? Well, the department um, and the agency in statutory terms are the same thing. They both report to Secretary of State for Health um, uh, as an agency. Uh, so looking at the capability in the public health system uh, and uh, looking uh, in the NHS, what tests could be done within uh, public health laboratories, what testing could be uh, scaled up elsewhere. Um, I'd say we worked on that together uh, and Prime Minister decided uh, to uh, uh, set up NHS test and trace in order to do that from uh, May, I think it was this year. I'm, I'm just trying to understand why the health secretary was critical specifically of Public Health England if, based on Professor Simpson's answer just now, Public Health England never had the capacity to scale up to meet this type of problem, which had already been anticipated in previous national security strategies. So is it not unfair to have blamed PHE for this if they didn't have the capacity to scale up in the first place? Yeah, so I think going, you know, uh, going back to um, what the health secretary said in August when he announced the creation of the National Institute, you know, there were uh, various things that he uh, praised Public Health England for, given the scale of what uh, um, pandemic and uh, testing, uh, that's one of the reasons uh, that he took the decision to um, set up uh, health protection on its own. Um, I don't think, you know, just going back over time, I don't think there was any agency that would have had the scale um, uh, to, you know, to have half a million tests a day um, that could just have capacity that could be turned on. 
but clearly in the design of uh, that new agency and others uh, will be doing it around the world, um, given what we have faced, thinking about uh, the amount of capacity uh, a country is happy to pay for to have spare at some points and, and what you can turn on and off or how you can turn uh, you know, capacity doing other things into this is gonna have to be uh, a part of uh, what we've learned from this and decisions will need to be taken on how much capacity uh, to have kind of ready to go at any time and how much you can switch on. Thank you for that. I mean, some countries did appear to be better prepared to respond quickly. Certainly that was the view of the Science and Technology Committee that looked at this issue fairly early on in the pandemic. And my last question back to Professor Simpson is that the government often refers to the Robert Koch Institute in Germany as the model it wants to adopt for the National Institute for Health Protection. But that institute in Germany relies on a very decentralized system where regional and local authorities have the budget, the people and the capacity to deal with these issues. And um, do you have any concerns about us taking that approach if we're not giving sufficient support or capacity to presumably local authorities in our circumstances to do this work as opposed to a national system? Uh, thank you, thank you. Um, I, I, as you say, the RKI and the German health system is, is a different system to the health system we have in the UK. Um, I, I think, I, I, I wouldn't agree with you. I think the, the, the policy that the government is following to be able to increase rapidly um, the ability to respond uh, to these sorts of threats is, it does seem to be a correct one. As you say, the German system is diff very different to the UK's um, and therefore it's very difficult to transfer internationally one model um, which is based on one set of uh, arrangements to another one, but uh, a, a robust system whereby um, responses can be escalated it would, it is definitely something, a lesson that's been learned from this situation. Just to push you very briefly and then I'll hand back to the chair. Are you therefore suggesting that it's the right approach to invest in a centralized system to deal with these? Or, or, or is your view that a capacity in a decentralized model is the better approach? Um, I think that what I think what I'm probably saying is it, it is best to invest in whatever the appropriate system for the way um, a jurisdiction is organized. I'm asking you, Professor Simpson, in your expert view, which you have a preference for. Is it centralized or decentralized, or, or do you not have a view? I, I don't. I don't have. A, I don't have a view on that. You don't have a view. Okay, I'll hand back to the chair. Thank you. Baroness Neville Jones, did you want to come in on this, or has your point been dealt with? Um. Um. There is a, there is obviously a big difference between uh, you know, systems which are centralized and decentralized, and it's um, it, it does seem to me that that this is now quite a big issue uh, in the management of COVID going forward. Um, if you don't personally have a view, could you characterize the nature of the debate in the department about the management of of or the extent to which the system should be decentralized? Don't know which of our witnesses would might like to take that. Perhaps Miss uh, Swinson. Thank you. Yes, I'm happy to. So. I mean, I think the question about what's centralised and what localised is a question of balance. I don't think that there's, um, uh, you know, any system is going to need a balance between the two. Uh, certain things work when you've got big economies of scale, whether that's call centres, uh, uh, some of the contact tracing. Um, but on the other hand, some things work much better uh, and or requires local knowledge. Um, uh, and uh, contact tracing requires uh, that. So uh, NHS Test and Trace is working with local authorities and testing uh, teams in local authorities, which I think is now uh, up in the 90s of local authorities who have those teams. Seeking the right balance between those two things, uh, you know, people debate and will have different views on that, but seeking the right getting the right balance is uh, what we're aiming to do um, to, so that you can do the things at scale and the things locally. Um, the only other thing I'd add is clearly, um, as uh, a number of people have mentioned already, 
uh, that debate people have different views on for public health but also has to fit into the system of government so of course that some other countries we look at do have a very different state or federal system uh, we've got one uh, that needs to work through our local authorities uh, and of course the debate about what the right balance is uh, has to take account of that or, or indeed uh, um, have a um, review uh, the situation and uh, uh, change that balance, but we've got to uh, start with the system we've got uh, between uh, central and local government. Thank you. Oh, it is of course the case. Oh, sorry, no. Pauline, carry on. No, sorry, no. <laughs> okay. I just want to say it, it is the case that the hospital system in this country is fairly decentralized with the different trusts. Uh, it's not entirely you know, central, central, central system, centralized system. I mean, do you foresee the, the local element getting bigger? or um, and, and responsibility, greater responsibility being taken locally for things like trust and trace in the future? Uh, thank you. Yes, um, mm. you're quite right. I didn't mean to imply that our system was a centralized one, just that the balance between those and the balance in local government and NHS uh, and you know other bits of public services differ. Um, I think given the scale uh, on testing uh, that we need to, that's already being, uh, you know, has, has already multiplied many times uh, and may continue to do so, I think, you know, that's going to need to be, um, uh, to a certain extent, localised just because of the capacity. Um, there's also the central uh, labs, which uh, uh, PHE run, labs in hospitals, private sector, uh, you know, it's going to need to be not something that is centralised, but takes advantage uh, of, um, already does uh, take advantage of uh, the labo laboratory capacity uh, and the contact tracing um, wherever uh, it currently sits. Well, thank you. I think you're quite right that the laboratory capacity has also to you know, be able to respond to greater localisation. Chairman, thank you very much. Baroness Healy. Thank you, Chair. Um, Ms. Swinson, I mean, you talk about capabilities and the need to be flexible, but um, you've got a terribly difficult task. And when making proposals to the Treasury in advance of the spending review, how does the department balance resources for its ongoing responsibilities with the resources it requires for contingency planning capabilities? And what lessons are you going to have to, to learn for needing so much greater resource than could ever have been envisaged before this pandemic hit? the country. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, you're quite right that given the um, uh, given the costs of the pandemic in a huge number of ways, um, the uh, the amount of resources that we as a country put into uh, our testing system, our health systems, for example, the surge capacity, uh, the Nightingale hospitals we haven't uh, yet mentioned, but in the NHS uh, is a balance uh, that uh, isn't just on uh, spare capacity um, that we mentioned on testing, but on a range of things. I mean, ultimately, these are political decisions that need to be made. Um, as uh, civil servants will advise our ministers about uh, the extent of um, uh, capability uh, that can be um, increased in scale. Uh, and those um, we'll advise on the health consequences uh, of course, the economic and the social ones, ministers uh, and cabinet and the prime minister ultimately uh, and the chancellor will need to, need to take decisions on. I mean, may I ask, do you fear that other elements of the health service are suffering too much without getting the resources they need? I do hear surgeons talking about, you know, they, they haven't got the resources that they want to do all the operations that have built up backlog. Yes, yeah, so I think um, the chief medical um, Officer has talked about this right from the beginning. There's the direct consequences of uh, COVID in health, and there's the indirect cons health consequences uh, for other things uh, that uh, uh, may not get the same resources. And then, of course, there are the uh, health consequences from economic, social, other factors. Um, definitely, um, one of the things uh, from the first wave going into this. Uh, autumn uh, that um, the NHS uh, is seeking to do is to keep non-COVID health services running as far as possible. Um, you know, there were um, a number of services uh, that uh, had to be um, paused in order to um, uh, be ready in the spring. I, I think the NHS has learned a lot about that uh, so that um, hopefully more of those can be kept on. 
uh, we also know actually that um, uh, sadly the public, e even when some services uh, or many services were kept on, the public didn't um, uh, always seek them. Um, and so a very strong message that you will have heard, you know, from Simon Stevens, from uh, politicians and others, that the NHS is open for business uh, across all of uh, its health services. Clearly in the areas currently under greatest strain uh, in uh, the Northwest, for example, um, mutual aid across uh, areas, uh, both for coronavirus capacity, but also thinking um, how other services can be uh, kept running uh, is a really important uh, operational issue uh, for NHS England uh, to be uh, uh, on top of and in other parts of the UK uh, for precisely the reasons uh, you point to. Thank you. Maris Hodgson, were you signalling to come in on this? Um, I was signalling to come in on the point before, actually, about testing. Do you want to take me at the end if there's time? I wanted to simply ask quickly about, we've had a lot of, uh, a lot of attention on obviously testing and tracing. And why have we abandoned testing on antibodies? It seems there's no public testing of antibodies and therefore we have no information on how many people have had COVID. It would be good for people to know that they have had COVID, they did have antibodies, therefore they were perhaps not so much as risk. But also it's the mental health aspect. For people living on their own, the only publicity they see is gloom and doom and death. And this, and many people are really suffering acute anxiety. And it would really be uh, hugely helpful to have more information on, on recovery rates from COVID rather than just the very negative press that's, that's being shown right now. And I think it would help many people if they realized that not everybody ended up on ventilators in intensive care. Um, that is certainly the case on the numbers of cases and uh, the numbers that then uh, translate into hospital admissions uh, and intensive care. Um, on antibodies, uh, I may have to ask uh, Sir Patrick uh, for the proper scientific uh, view, but as I understand it, the sensitivity of those tests uh, compared to um, those for whether you've got the um, virus currently uh, is much harder uh, to uh, be confident on, uh, which means that in terms of what tests uh, are available, we need to um, make sure that they're effective. Uh, and indeed that when someone gets the result that there's something that they can do with it. Uh, so we don't, there are lots of unknowns on the science for antibodies, uh, immunity, how long it lasts and so on. So that's a big area of scientific investigation and debate, not just in the UK, uh, but globally. Um, and um, in terms of the number of people, there are various sample studies uh, as well, the ONS uh, and others and internationally, uh, which I think also speak to your point about um, you know, how many people have actually had the virus, what that translates to in terms of cases, uh, and how many people in the uh, population um, have had it in a, either asymptomatic or a uh, mild uh, version, uh, which um, I agree with. Would it be helpful for me to make a few comments on that? Please do. Um, what we now see is that the vast majority of people who catch COVID asymptomatically or symptomatically get an antibody. So we know the antibody response occurs in most people. Um, we know that some of those antibodies are what are called neutralizing antibodies. They are antibodies that will bind the virus and stop it being able to enter cells. And it looks like those neutralizing antibodies, as you would expect, do confer some degree of protection. So all of that is, is good news. Um, not everybody gets the same antibody profile. So people get slightly different antibody profiles. We also know that um, antibodies can wane after a few months. So we see antibody levels decreasing in some people. And we also know that some people can get reinfected. So um, although there's a lot going on with antibody studies, particularly to find out on a survey level, how many people have had the infection, where, they, where those people are located. So we know, for example, in London, in the first wave, it was probably something like 17% or so of the population were infected, whereas in most other parts of the country, it was quite a lot less than that. Overall in the country from antibody studies, you'd say about 6% of the population got infected. 
it's much less predictive for you as an individual as to whether you are now protected against it and for how long. We don't know for how long and we don't know the degree of protection. And so antibody tests, if you like, are clinically a bit less useful at the moment, but they're very important in terms of trying to understand uh, numbers of infections and to understand increasingly whether this confers protection and if so, for how long. But I don't think we have absolute answers on those things yet. It is work being done on them. Yeah, yes, it's, it's a very, very active, very active area of research on antibodies and other forms of immunity to try and understand um, the, the degree of protection and how long it may last for. Thank you. Baroness Healy, have you finished? Can I go on to Mr Elwood? Yeah, Mr Elwood, please. Thank you very much uh, indeed. I just want to um, move on to some questions relating to uh, the vaccines, but in the context of vaccines, it's also to do with organization. Uh, and I begin with a very short uh, request, please, uh, whether you agree that uh, we should be uh, stopping to overpromise um, and need to manage the message far, far better if we are to keep the national resolve in what will be a, a six very difficult months ahead of us. Um, and Mr. Valens. Uh, well, you, you might be able to tell from the way I've spoken very often that I do think we should not overpromise. I think it's very important that we give a realistic picture of where things are. Um, and um, if I do, you want me to take the, that in, the, in, in in response to vaccines in particular? Do you want me to answer that question? Uh, yes, please. Yeah. So vaccines. Um, if you think about the previous history of vaccines, um, there. Are, the average time of taking a vaccine, making a vaccine from scratch is over 10 years. And um, it's never been done before in under about five years at the very quickest. We're now in an extraordinary situation where there are um, at least eight vaccines that are in quite large clinical studies around the world. Some of which will start to read out from their late stage, so the, the end stage clinical studies over the next few months. So we will know, I think, over the next few months, whether we have any vaccines that really do protect and if so, how long they protect for. What we do know is that the, there are a number of vaccines that um, create an immune response. That's good news. They do make people get antibodies and those antibodies, at least some of them are neutralizing. So that's all good news, but that's a necessary step on vaccine production. It's not the, not the answer. The answer comes from the phase three clinical trials when you find out do these things actually stop you from getting infected and if so how effective are they and we will know that over the next few months and at that point uh, we'll also have some clearer idea on the safety profile of these vaccines and from there can start um, looking at what a, a sensible vaccination um, strategy could be uh, across the population and uh, I've been clear right from um, January that I thought unlikely to have vaccines um, for uh, any sort of widespread use in the community before at least um, uh, spring next year. We may get a few doses before that. But we'll see. That's very clear indeed. And I think that's what we need to hear because each, each week, each day almost, we're seeing different messaging in the newspapers and different commentators and you're making it very, very clear that we have a number of difficult months ahead in this harsh winter and we shouldn't expect anything by the spring. It is that clarity of message which is so important if we're to keep the national resolve together. And I would encourage more number 10 briefings for that exact reason. But the rollout of a vaccine, whatever that might be, and you've gone through some of the difficulties, will be an enormous challenge on the lines of what we saw during the war with munitions or weapon systems as well. And the organization needs to start soonest. I'm aware that, that the, the health secretary has requested the, or not requested, but suggested the use of the armed forces. None of the military, as far as I'm aware, very senior, have been given any formal request of the need to start planning now to organize how the spoken hub system might work, how the refrigerated systems might work, the database that might be required, how you provide local deliveries, how it ties in with uh, current NHS systems and structures. This is a mammoth task, I'm sure you'd understand, and it does require now organizing with, I think, a lead point, one individual who is logistically an expert, 
rather than necessarily being a health expert, because that's what's required here. Would you agree? Uh, yes, I think I think perhaps Clara Swinson from DHSC may want to talk about this because clearly DHSC will be um, responsible for um, vaccination strategy. But I think this is a big logistic challenge. There's no question about that. Please. Thank you. Yes. Uh, good afternoon. So um, just to take your first point, um, uh, to agree with Sir Patrick, and I know uh, that uh, the CMO would say the same and has on many occasions, this is a marathon, not a sprint. Uh, and uh, this is something uh, where we need to progress work uh, on all kinds of uh, areas and there isn't a single solution and testing isn't a single solution and vaccines isn't a single solution either. Uh, but to come to your uh, main point, um, if and when a vaccine, uh, if it passes the uh, many hurdles uh, that uh, the CSA has talked about, uh, if and when one is available, uh, clearly we need to be um, and are planning now on the deployment of that. Um, you are quite correct that it is a huge logistical challenge. Uh, the Health Secretary has asked um, uh, NHS England uh, to um, run that deployment uh, plan. Uh, obviously, we need to work with colleagues uh, right across uh, the whole of the UK. Um, I think there are there are a number of things um, uh, that can be planned for, but there are a number of things where the uncertainty about the vaccine and its characteristics means that uh, we're not going to know until, uh, if and until uh, uh, we know which vaccines uh, are being deployed. But the scale of the task um, is uh, large. I uh, would have thought, um, I know that uh, there are um, discussions uh, with MOD, um, I'll pick up if they haven't gone to a, a senior enough uh, level uh, about that. Uh, I think that's a, probably around the spec of what we require because of the uncertainties that we've got on the deployment program. Uh, but just, you know, the supply, the logistics, the supply things that we need, the logistics, the data systems and so on are all being uh, worked on. Um, the scale at the NHS England, um, you know, there is a flu vaccine every year that's um, uh, tens of millions of doses. So there is something uh, of this kind of scale that is done each year. But of course, the time frame, uh, the uh, importance uh, and the timeliness and the interest that will be in this will, I agree, be of a scale that uh, we haven't seen before uh, and uh, where we're going to need to uh, work with all kinds of uh, uh, bits of the public sector and the military in order to uh, be able to do that. I, I, good to hear that, but I strongly urge that you lean on the expertise of the military. It, it, the MOD is the one department that does horizon plan. They train for emergency response. They have the strategic thinkers and the logistic capability to do this. And I, again, I underline the fact that we need to start considering this now because mass vaccination centers, mobile sites, roving teams and so on, even legislation required to allow individuals who are not currently um, uh, legislated to do so, to give vaccines, uh, needs to go through. Lots to be thought about. I think I've made the point. I would like to just go back, if I may, Chair, very quickly, just to do with the wider issue, which connects with this, that we have policy design and then we have operational delivery. And I don't believe that we've done enough to distinguish between the two. We've not moved to a proper war footing. This is the government um, not doing, uh, understanding that this isn't like a flooding or indeed a terrorist attack where a COBRA is called, National Security Council uh, is, uh, is, is reviewed and what's going on and you illustrate some answers. This is ongoing, enduring, and it requires faster, uh, simpler decision-making, fewer people at the top. And once the policy is then decided, the strategy is then agreed, it slid over across to a task force running a situation center that can then implement this. Instead, we have ministers that have no experience in emergency planning, let alone operational delivery, phoning up chasing PPE, for example, that we saw at the beginning. And as like I said, we have six more months of this, and I still don't see a distinction between operational delivery and the policy planning at the very, very top. That's, that's very interesting. And, um, and there are many people who may share your view. I don't think it's probably quite fair to ask any of our witnesses to comment on it, though. Uh, it remains clearly um, on the record. Mr. Graham, I know you wanted to come in on this area. Chair, thank you very much. Um, I, I did want to come in briefly, if, if I might. Um, Sir Patrick, looking at at your CV, you've had a huge amount of experience of 
R&D on new medicines and so on. And so I'm just interesting, when I looked at the chart that we were shown on the National Risk Register of Civil Emergencies, there's, there's a, a, a chart which shows response to such uh, uh, threats, indicating detection antivirals, vaccines, and personal protective equipment. And under vaccines, it says these will be developed as soon as possible. Once new flu strains are identified, this will take at least four to six months. The, the time between when we first identified this pandemic, which I'm assuming is broadly late December, early January of this year, um, to the timing that you were suggesting, the spring of next year, that's significantly longer. Does that mean that basically in terms of our strategy, we've underestimated the length of time that it does take to provide vaccines for pandemics? Um, no, okay, that, that, that there's a fundamental difference between a flu vaccine, which you already have, mm -hmm. and adapting it as we do every year for a new strain, which is obviously a process which is built into the manufacturing, everything's in place, it's about making sure you've got the right strain, versus inventing a totally new vaccine. So in terms of the strategic approach to vaccines for a totally new strain, what sort of time span should, should we actually bear in mind when planning strategy? Well, uh, prior to what has been achieved with this, I would have said five years minimum. Gosh. So in terms then, um, if I can I, turn to... Sorry, sorry do, do go on. Can I just ca caveat one thing? There has been a remarkable change in vaccine technology in the past few years. And I think this does mean going forward, this could look quite different. There's been essentially one or two ways of making vaccines for the past um, 30 years or more. Um, but in the last five years or so, there have been techniques which allow you to go from the sequence of the virus, the genetic sequence of the virus to a vaccine a experimental vaccine in a period of a very just a few weeks then you've got all the testing and manufacturing but there is now a way and and and, and these first wave of vaccines so-called messenger rna vaccines is one of them um are going to be first out of the block for for um covid i think and and so we'll see then whether they work and if they do that could radically change how one thinks about vaccinology and that could accelerate that period but up until now that hasn't been possible that's very helpful. So you're effectively saying that strategically, the current planning time would be five years to develop a vaccine, but that's now coming down quite sharply, but it's still looking like around 18 months. Is, is it, that the... It, it could, if these messenger RNA vaccines work, and I'm just picking on them as an example, it could even be faster than that in the event of an outbreak of a new disease. They, they do provide remarkable speed potentially. Right. And, and bearing that in mind, can I turn, Chair, to, to, to Clara Swinson? Um, Ms. Swinson, I mean, bearing in mind Sir Patrick's comments on that, it, it does look to, to a lot of us as if the way the government has to respond to a pandemic challenge like this is to really bear in mind, above all, what is our capacity for dealing with it if we have people who need to go to hospital and need to go <coughs> on to ventilators. That does seem to be the driving force in the containment strategy. So do you think that strategically we should be trying to analyze how long it is realistically going to take to provide a vaccine solution for a new strain in the way that Sir Patrick's suggesting? Because that then enables you to plan effectively for how long you need to protect the NHS, quote unquote, and, and for how long you're going to need additional bed capacity, more ventilators okay. and so on. Okay, uh, if, if I could ask you to be a little bit brief in your reply, because we do want to move on to another area. Of course, uh, thank you. Um, so on um, vaccines, we talked about the reasonable worst case scenario earlier. This is one area where ministers have asked us to prepare for the reasonable best case scenario. There are many challenges on the time frame um, and the history as uh, Sir Patrick has set out, uh, but that is why um, uh, led through Bayes and the Vaccines Task Force, uh, we're looking at how we can be ready as early as that can uh, come on. Um, I think uh, if I just take the last um, 
point to the question. Um, so I don't think, and uh, I think CMO and uh, the CSA uh, have said uh, similar things in the past. I don't think it is a single vaccine um, that will um, uh, bring this pandemic to an end. It's work across vaccines, it's improvements in treatment, it's novel treatments, it's prevention, it's testing, and it is probably keeping uh, some of the measures, uh, hopefully, and I'm sure not on the extreme side, uh, but the way that uh, we have changed, you know, everything from uh, hygiene, COVID secure premises and so on, we're going to need I, a balance. I, I understand. I understand your point on this one. The point, Chair, I was just gently trying to get it was strategically and in terms of planning for any future events. Isn't this the crucial bit of information that we really need? Because once you know roughly how long it's going to take to develop a vaccine solution, you can then say, right, this is the period of time that we need to plan in order to have the beds, the ventilators and the NHS people in place for until we've got that mass solution. Isn't that, I mean, I'm just asking the question, isn't that one of the most crucial questions we need to know in advance? Yes, um, and on uh, flu vaccine, uh, we, would, we had an idea about how that, how long that would be on this vaccine and uh, the different technologies that Sir Patrick talked about. There were many more uncertainties. Thank and you so much. Baroness Neville Jones, please. Uh, you're muted. Yes. Um, I wonder if we could move on uh, to the question of testing and the lessons that we've learned from that. Um, we hear the, the lay public hears about uh, uh, exercising that took place, um, and what I'd be interested to know is uh, how the department and PHE subsequently took on board the results of that uh, exercise. Uh, do you think, in fact, that you took on board the, all the elements that should have been in the case, and um, how has, as a result, um, you know, behaviour and uh, what you've done changed as a result of that exercise. Um, I think probably that's for uh, Ms. Swinson yeah. primarily, but others may wish to comment too. Of course, thank you. Um, so yes, there's an extensive um, exercising and testing programme. Um, and uh, as well as that, of course, there have been lots of incidents uh, uh, whether that's uh, terrorism, uh, severe infectious diseases that were contained, a uh, small number of cases and so on that we learn from. Um, of course, you know, how effective that, um, you know, it's a very good baseline uh, to have. Uh, we learn from each of those exercises uh, that we've done and uh, we and uh, at PHE or I can talk a bit more about uh, that. How effective that baseline is, the extent of the um, exercising how far the lessons uh, were learned from uh, uh, and put into place uh, and we're ready to go is obviously going to be a matter for further reflection um, at uh, a later point after we're through this pandemic. I don't... Does anyone else have got that? Um, one thing that worries me about that exercise is, you know, that it, it only dealt with a couple of the stages of the pandemic. Um, and it didn't deal with some of the ones that have actually proved most testing. In addition to which there were the reports, the report came out, which made a series of recommendations. As far as I can tell, uh, they weren't implemented. So one does ask the question, what is the value of, uh, is we, are we kidding ourselves in holding an exercise of that kind when it doesn't actually deal with all of the stages that you need to go through and which have identified? And secondly, the outcomes and the recommendations are not then followed through. It, it, this isn't, it, it isn't a model, it seems to me, that's, that's actually working at the moment. So on the exercising, um, Cygnus itself, as you say, it ran as an exercise, you're quite right, you've got to choose some elements uh, for, that for, the, for that exercise. There were, there were tabletop exercises and a range of other things, uh, but you know, whether um, to what extent um, everything was uh, tested uh, and the balance between what you choose between these kind of biological risks, preparing, for example, for terrorism attacks and so on. Um, many of the ways that agencies have to work together are similar, whatever the um, incident is, but others are specific. So there's a balance uh, to be uh, struck there. 
Um, I'm not sure what report you're referring to uh, on the recommendations that you think haven't been implemented um, in terms of the uh, Cygnus report and the uh, recommendations. Uh, I can tell you, I mean, there were, there were recommendations about the procurement of things like of, of uh, PPE. Uh, the whole series of practical things which were recommended, which, as far as I can tell, weren't followed through. I mean, I get the impression that, I mean, I understand all the difficulties, um, but uh, I hope you're not telling us that you regard that outcome as, as in a, a successful model of how testing should actually give you a good basis for then uh, following through on the recommendations and being of real value. It seems to me on the whole, what happened was it gave false comfort. But a lot of things that should have been done weren't followed up. So not at all am I saying that um, uh, that whole exercising program uh, is a perfect program. I'm just saying that you need to choose various, you need to choose which elements. Yes, I accept that. Um, mm. And uh, uh, PHE um, design, not just uh, Cygnus, but a range of uh, tests uh, that uh, um, John might want to talk more about. Uh, in terms of the recommendations, um, go ahead. Sorry, Chair. Professor Simpson? Yes. Um, as as uh, Klaus Winston is saying, uh, PHE has for many years uh, 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 run and designed um, exercise and predecessor organisations exercises uh, for the health sector primarily, but for some exercises such as pandemic flu exercises for a much wider set of, of, of stakeholders. Um, as, as, was, as has been said, these are based on what the national risk assessments and what NHS England and, DH, and DHSC regard and, and ourselves regard as the highest and most pertinent threats at the time. And this is reviewed regularly yearly. Um, with the pandemic influenza exercise, and I believe the report is being published this week, um, what, what one has to do it, is to look at what are the what are the parameters and in which you were going to test? And we did test a great number of parameters. One thing that is particularly difficult in general with exercising is, is long-term stress testing, because um, you can't really take people out of their job for a month and, and have them part of an exercise. So there isn't always going to be an element of artificiality about that. However, you know, we do try and, and, and exercise designers worldwide do try and uh, take, this, take this in. On, on, um, on, on the exercise itself, um, so 950 people did take part in it. So it was a large scale um, exercise to look at how a pandemic influenza um, and I stress that um, uh, pandemic might 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 play out, particularly on health and, and on the health sector. So I'll, I'll finish there, Chair. Lord Harris. So, oh, sorry, <laughs> Lady Neville Jones. No, I just want to say, do, do regard the outcome, therefore, of that, of that uh, uh, exercise as being, would you judge it as successful and fulfilling its purpose? Um, it, it, the, the purpose of the exercise from as we were as we were approached was to run a, a pandemic influenza scenario which had, had um, input from uh, many stakeholders across government. The, the exercise was run and um, the, and the report was written and re the recommendations um, were made. Um, and there have been previous exercises also, um, about pandemic influenza um, and therefore once the exercise is done then from that point of from that as an exercise yes I think it was successful. So the, the fact that the recommendations weren't and then weren't followed up uh, is that it, you think it's successful but not your responsibility or it didn't matter? Um, I, I think I think I think saying they weren't followed up is a, is a is a rather is is rather strong. And when the ex, when the report is is published, I think that will be that will be apparent. Um, 
it, it some of some of the some of the uh, recommendations were for PHE. Uh, some of them for, were for other agencies, and it's for those. It's for all the agencies involved and all the departments involved to take away their re recommendations for their activity and to look at how they might address those amongst um, in the future. I no, don't want to take the parallel too far, but I am reminded of the observation that the operation was successful, but the patient died. Lord Harris. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I'm tempted to follow up and say it was obviously so successful that um, we've been waiting four years or whatever it is for the report to be published. Um, but I want to move back briefly to local resilience forums. I think you, we were told earlier that uh, they had received a reasonable worst case scenario on a pandemic, uh, pandemic flu. But I'd like to focus on the workings with local resilience forums, both in terms of the risk assessments and the preparations in advance of COVID-19, but perhaps even more importantly, during the pandemic itself. How well did that work? And perhaps we could start with um, Ms Swinson. Um, thanks. So, I mean, local resilience forums that bring together, you know, all the agencies in a local area, um, they're um, varied. Uh, but in terms of, um, you know, the response in local areas um, and the work with uh, the NHS, uh, which is, and uh, social care, which is obviously uh, our responsibility from our department, um, I think that those two things in terms of the resilience of those two sectors, they often uh, differ. Um, there are a range of other things that the Cabinet Office and MHCOG um, and other departments uh, have uh, are re requiring local authorities to do. Obviously, they're under a, a lot of pressure. Um, so I think um, the ba it comes back to this question of, that we were uh, discussing earlier about the balance between national and local. Okay, but could I ask more generally, and um, not just to you, but to the others, do you think, having experienced and gone through the COVID process or going through it, does this show any need for particular changes to local resilience forums, to the system as a whole, are the lessons which you can already draw from the way things have worked? And I'd be interested in both your comments, um, Clara Swinson, but also from the from the other two witnesses. Um, so definitely the scale of contact tracing and um, uh, testing we've talked about, uh, and the uh, the role of the. Um, uh, local director of public health is an incredibly uh, important one, such a responsibilities, uh, and they need to be supported uh, with the resources to do uh, their job in a local area. Um, I think that, um, you know, just going back to the uh, conversation we were having, you know, certain things are tested. We are undoubtedly in a better position. Uh, I believe that we've worked on all of the recommendations uh, from the Sydney's report, whether that's national or local, uh, but clearly, um, uh, how effective beyond that and whether other things should have been uh, tested, including at local level, um, uh, people have got, you know, reasonable questions about that. I don't know whether either Professor Simpson or uh, Sir Patrick want to add anything to that. Um, yes, I, th I think the point I made earlier about, about um, the, way, the way local resources and, and being able to increase increase the amount of activity and resources that there are at local levels to do particularly test and trace and to do and to do uh, contact tracing in future and how that can be expanded i'll make one comment if i may which is not on local resilience for which is really not my area but i think there's one thing that is relevant to not only this emergency uh, but to other things on the national risk register as well which are data, data ownership, data flows and analytics, and being very clear where all those things lie in any risk is crucially important. And I think it's a very key lesson to get that right across all of the risks. That could take us off in all sorts of interesting byways, <laughs> which I will resist. But could I just ask one final question um, very quickly? Do you think there are any lessons from how the different devolved administrations have handled the crisis, and I don't know who wants to go first. 
Well, I think I think from a science and, and, and medical point of view, we've been very joined up, actually. Um, and, and that's worked really well. And I know the chief medical officer would echo that. He meets with the devolved CMOs um, uh, very, very frequently. They've been completely joined up and we've had um, um, all of the devolves on SAGE. And although they've got their own science advice mechanisms as well, it all feeds from um, um, from what's going on uh, across the science world. So I think it's been pretty joined up from that perspective. Um, I, I won't comment on the operational policy aspects, others may wish to. Swinson. Thank you. Um, so, uh, you know, in terms of my role, I'm either responsible for things that are UK wide or devolved, but I'll uh, take your question. Clearly, there are areas where uh, the four nations have taken different paths, and um, one of the things that we'll be able to do is compare and contrast those choices. One of the lessons I would definitely take from that is that, you know, politicians take different uh, decisions uh, and the balance between them. Um, we know, though, it is, and I know some of your previous um, witnesses were talking about this, uh, it's very hard for people who are living uh, near a, um, uh, a border, uh, particularly when the uh, guidance is uh, different. Of course, that's a, it's a consequence of the devolved uh, system we've got, uh, but the, uh, the communications uh, um, in each uh, administration uh, is definitely um, something that we know is, uh, uh, is difficult for people um, because of those differences. Thank you. Professor Simpson. Um, yeah, from the public health and public health response um, aspects, we had very close working relationships with our colleagues in uh, public health departments and agencies in the devolved administrations. We have a meeting, we've had meetings every day um, uh, throughout the pandemic, starting in January, where we've discussed things jointly. Um, so that the, the, the unders, there are, and we'll be learning lessons and looking to increase the, our ability to co coordinate our activity in the future. Lord Paul. Hello, Sorry, let me bring together just one question about lessons which can be learned both from home and, and abroad. I mean, the three of you have lived with this for nine months or more now, and you, you've done heroically. Um, when we look back over it, are there one or two points you think from your own personal experience, if we'd done it this way, it might have worked out better? Or when you look at one or two other countries, are there points you say, Maybe they were, maybe they got it more right than, than we did. I'm not. I'm not asking for criticism of the government or anything like that. It's, uh, government's quite hard enough without vicarious criticism. But are there just one or two points you would draw to our attention as to how things objectively could have been done differently and might have had a better result if we had followed the example of other countries or the lessons we derived ourselves? So Sir Patrick? Uh, yes, um, I've mentioned one, which is um, on data, understanding what data no, is. And we were flying blind for quite a long time because we didn't have data and, and therefore you can't make decisions in the absence of data. I think the second observation would be in all of these public health areas, you need significant spare capacity, you need surge capacity. You can't run at a minimum. Um, the third I'd say is that um, we haven't got a significant um, private sector testing um, capacity in this country. And that was quite important, certainly in some areas like like uh, Germany. And I think the general lesson that has become clear is that uh, when you see um, a disease like this moving, um, you've got to move fast. You've got to go in quite hard with the uh, measures you take. And you've probably got to go a bit, a bit um, broader in the geography. Than you Thank you. Mr. Swinson. Thank you. Um, I agree with those points. Um, I would just uh, widen uh, the one that Sir Patrick has just made. Uh, you know, it, a crisis, you know, a pandemic like this, uh, it shows up where the countries are, where, where our strengths are and where um, our weaknesses are. So on our manufacturing capacity, there's both diagnostics, there was uh, our reliance uh, on uh, PPE, uh, where there was no um, UK uh, manufacturing really. Uh, it shows up our strengths uh, in other areas. 
um, but uh, and domestic ventilators, uh, there wasn't industry, so it, so it shows up those. Um, the only other thing I would say is clearly the, the communications and the behavioural aspect of these things. You know, you can plan really well, you can get great policies, you can even get great operations, uh, but really thinking about, um, uh, you know, why people act as they do, uh, what the best messages uh, are uh, in order to um, increase compliance and the balance between enforcement and support. Uh, you know, those are... Um, you know, hard things to get right. Uh, and um, I think there are lessons on that uh, that I would draw. Thank you. And Professor Simpson. Um, I think um, the ability to um, increase and have spare or trained capacity for for um, expert and, uh, and operational roles and then the ability to increase, increase numbers. Um, the, the second thing is, is that um, th this was a new virus, um, which which came from an unexpected, quite an unexpected source. So I think one thing we for the future is is increasingly to look to the unexpected, um, and uh, try not to fight the old the old military adage of um, trying to fight the last battle um, is 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 going to be important. That we need to look at where where things may come from and also have systems that can respond to that. Thank you, very clear, useful answers, thank you. Yes, there were, and I just make one observation, which is that basically it seems to me that you're telling us that we've been running on far too tight a margin uh, in too many areas for far too long, which when it comes to our basic remit is, is something that would be of concern to us when we look at other issues which are in the risk register as tier one risks. Um, maybe that's something um, for us to think about more widely. Uh, can I um, thank all of you very much indeed, particularly as I said at the outset, for coming at a time when you're under so much pressure elsewhere. We really do appreciate it. Um, thank you very much indeed. I'm going to draw the committee to a close. Order, order. Thank you. Right.